Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Spiritual Insights with Charlotte Spicer. Spirituality and Metaphysics Talk Radio, featuring a course in miracles, dream interpretation, guided meditation, and the psychic and metaphysics free-for-all. It's your opportunity to consult with a professional psychic medium, discuss past lives, the chakras, and more. We are non-denominational, and there are no limits. Want to change your life? You must first change your mind. 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 No matter your religious structure, cultivate peace in your reality through self-awareness with an authentic spiritual teacher. And now, your host, Charlotte Spicer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Spiritual Insights. And today is our monthly segment on A Course in Miracles, and I'll be joined by my special co-host, Dr. Robert Rosenthal, and today we'll be continuing the discussion we were having before the summer hiatus, where we were uh, talking about common questions that are often asked of the Course, such as, what's the best way to study it, what is meant by the atonement, we covered some really good information in our previous segment, and we want to continue um, that momentum today. If you are new to the show, let me explain to you about my special co-host. We refer to him affectionately as Dr. Bob, and he joins me on the second Thursday of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern. He was a student of A Course in Miracles since before it was published. He was also a close personal friend of Dr. Bill Thetford, co-scribe of A Course in Miracles, and has served on the board of directors of the Foundation for Inner Peace, who publishes the course since 1992. He's a board-certified psychiatrist in private practice near Princeton, New Jersey, and he's also the author of From Plagues to Miracles, The Transformational Journey of Exodus, From the Slavery of Ego to the Promised Land of Spirit. The book interprets the biblical story of Exodus and demonstrates the ego's perception of life's conditions. In our segments, we often refer to Dr. Bob's book for additional information and explanation of spiritual concepts. So, if you feel you have a question you'd like to ask us, feel free to call in by dialing area code 347-934-0751. In the meantime, join me in welcoming back to the show, Dr. Bob. Hi, Bob. Hey, Char. How you doing? I'm doing good. Doing We've good. had a nice break here over the summer, and now uh, we can reconvene. <laughs> yes, yes. It's good to be back. Same. Um, one thing I probably should clarify uh, when you said in my intro that I was a student of the course before its publishing, just to that means its official hardbound publishing in 1976. Um, it, it had been out in you know a very small restricted publication in 1975, and that's that's how I picked it up. Uh, nice. But you know, some people really like the technical niceties, and so just to be technical. Yeah, it had been unofficially published. It was just Xeroxed from the original um, Black Thesis binders, um, but uh, it was, you know, officially published as a hardback book in 1976. And I started in December of 1975, almost uh, on my 40th anniversary. Wow! Yeah, and it's such a cool story because your pages were the, like the mimeograph things as you described them to yeah, anyone. Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty cool. I just think that's a cool factoid to throw out there that you're yeah. intimately familiar with the course and you know it's uh it's it's just great to be able to have these these uh segments with you to really delve deep thank you do you have any um speaking engagements coming up anything you'd like to announce no i do not and uh that's mostly by choice i'm trying to clear out a bunch of time so that i can you know get uh, a number of writing projects going and launched and uh mm-hmm. i don't even like to talk about them cuz uh you know i don't know where they're going until they take shape um but i have cleared the decks i am sure there will be some local events just back at the end of August, we had a, a wonderful little get-together um, here in North Jersey in the home and extensive gardens of uh, some local course students, John and Lainey Bevan. And um, we're going to get all of those uh, those talks, including mine, up on YouTube. And uh, they are well worth checking out. When they're up on YouTube, I will um, you know, let all of us know. 
um, both from my website and uh, on our, our show here. Okay, that sounds good. And then I'll do my thing. So yeah. where, would, where would you like to start for today? We covered a lot of good stuff last time. Yeah, and it's far enough away that I don't even remember what we covered. And uh, since the past is over, it can touch me not. Uh, we could either start if you have a topic from there. Um, there were a couple of things that different students brought to me in the course of the summer uh, that, that I could talk about. Um, but you had mentioned one before the show uh, that I thought would be especially useful Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, maybe you could read that question from a student. Yep. Okay. And, and that was this. If, quote, nothing in this room, et cetera, means anything, is it wrong or egotistical to strive for abundance or to want to surround myself with beautiful, yet ultimately meaningless, things, quote, unquote? And that's, I, it, it's a good question because I, I feel that things are symbols and poverty is a symptom of something larger what how would you address that from yeah the it's, a, it's a really good question and i think it, it goes right to the heart of <clears throat> where a course in miracles is significantly different than a lot of other shall we call them new age systems mm -hmm. so first i want to start at the end of the question is it wrong i don't believe that a course in miracles or jesus christ or any really enlightened being would ever tell anyone that they were wrong to do just about anything because from the course perspective which is a non-dual perspective that is to say there's only one reality and that's not where we're living the one reality is god um, so from that perspective yes anything you do here is still encompassed by illusion it's all you know you're, you're just moving the deck chairs on the titanic around mm -hmm. and that becomes very problematic for people because they can take it to oh what i shouldn't wish for health and 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 you know uh wealth and well-being for everyone um including myself and my family and that's on the one hand on the other hand they go well then what's to keep us from just going out and killing lots of people um if if none of it really matters so it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's not that it's wrong. The moment we start talking uh, in concepts of right and wrong, we're sort of edging into that dangerous territory of this is sinful or this is not. We may not use the word sin, but there's an idea that there's some higher order that determines, you know, whether you've been naughty or nice and are going to get, you know, presents from God at Christmas or not. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not about is it wrong. What I would substitute there is, is it helpful? You know, is focusing on abundance, um, is focusing on, you know, beauty helpful? Or is it ultimately an obstacle that gets in the way of your spiritual journey? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that depends a great deal on where you are in your journey and how attached you are to those concepts. So, again, in a world of form, there's nothing wrong or right, good or bad, about, about any aspect of form. And, you know, where I come at this from, uh, from the, the perspective of the book of Exodus is whatever allows you to move forward into freedom, into a recognition of that oneness that is your essential nature and God's essential nature, um, whatever lets you do that is quote-unquote good. Whatever gets in the way is a problem. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar um, with From Plagues to Miracles, my book, I look at the, uh, the, the, the traditional story of Exodus with Moses and Pharaoh as a beautiful example of this. I see Pharaoh, the character of Pharaoh in Exodus, as an exemplar of our ego voice. I see Moses as an exemplar of that within us which, which knows that we are more than the world of, of physical illusion, we're more than a body, and wants to return home. So the back and forth between those two becomes very illustrative in that if we're identified with ego and we think we want things of this world, ultimately we're going to be disappointed. Ultimately we're going to run into plagues in Exodus speak uh, or hardships or obstacles 
And we can either see those as frustrating and a cause for doubling down and making even more effort to get what we want, or we might want to pull back um, and go to a larger perspective and ask, well, if this doesn't seem to be happening in my life, why might it not be? Um, personal example, I spent nine years working on screenwriting and developing screenplays, having options on my screenplays, really, really wanting to be a success in that realm. Mm -hmm. And and I, I was good at it. I worked with my wife. She was good at it. We got very close multiple times, an option, something going to a great producer, uh, a TV pilot that you know, an, a top agent really liked and said he'd shop for us. But it never quite crossed that finish line. And finally, when we did have a movie shot of one of my screenplays, um, it was like an experience of heaven and hell in that in the opening, watching my movie come to life, I felt that it doesn't get any better than this. And remember, mm -hmm. I've been a course student for a long time. I should know better. Um, and then within a matter of weeks, returning to the set and seeing everything in shambles and ultimately realizing this is a dead end. It's not going to work. Out of that dead end, which, I, believe me, I was not happy. I was really, um, you know, quite devastated and perturbed at one level. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this enough that at another level, I knew that there had to be a meaning to it. And in backing away, what eventually came forward was my book, From Plagues to Miracles. And I'll tell you what, if I had a choice of what my legacy was to leave to humankind in terms of what would would allow people the greatest um, sense of, of their own fulfillment, writing a screenplay that may even have been a hit movie for a few weeks, um, okay, that would have been cool, and then it would have been gone. Writing this other book, which feels like it was very much on path, but which is something I never would have come to on my own without the plague, the obstacle, the roadblock to my screenwriting career, I mean, there's no question in retrospect which was the right path for me, but I didn't know it at the time. So coming back to the original question, there is nothing wrong with abundance and beauty, um, but they are not the path to salvation. Abundance can be defined in many ways by many people, and I think where we want to go with that is the understanding that if we are walking our path, if our deep commitment, and in fact, our only commitment, because of course in Miracles says the atonement, the path home, is a total commitment, and we could even talk about that more in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if we're walking our path, we do need to trust that we will be taken care of. But the moment we start specifying what that's supposed to look like, okay, Holy Spirit, okay, God, you're going to take care of me. But, you know, if you're going to take care of me, I need at least $5 million in the bank. Um, I need a home here. I need a home. I mean, now you are very much in the ego world. You are, you are attached to certain forms. Um, and I would say you are getting in the way of what spirit might have in mind for you. Now, if you're coming from a place of great deprivation or of a belief that somehow you're not worthy uh, or that the world is a dangerous, depriving place that, that just never gives you what you want, then it may be that one of those early stages on your path will be to discover that, lo and behold, you do get what you need and that it is okay to be taken care of or, or to have money show up unexpectedly where, where you never would have imagined it. And, and that would be a message of you are being taken care of. But at a different point on, on your journey, as with me in the screenwriting, it might be that something you think you want very much is actually an obstacle that it's coming from an ego place. Now, mm -hmm. if you had asked me at the time, I would not have said screenwriting was coming from an ego place. I would have told you I'm writing spiritually oriented screenplays. People will see these. They will um, resonate with the story and wake up in ways that they might not otherwise have done. All true, perhaps, but it wasn't my path. It wasn't what right. I was supposed to do. And yet, the screenwriting served me because it taught me how to write better. And then when I went and wrote From Plagues to Miracles, I was, quite frankly, already a much better writer. 
So in terms of abundance, there are many, many um, you know, new age teachers out there who are telling you that you can have whatever you want, that, that we manifest, that mind is the causative agent and the world just follows what mind is doing. And that is by and large true. I mean, the Course says projection makes perception. Uh, in another place, Lesson 304, it says perception is a mirror, not a fact. It's reflecting back to us what's in our minds. And in that sense, it's a very nice feedback system for saying, here's what's in your mind. How'd that work out for you? How did that feel? Do you need to stick with that or not? Um, so, yes, we do create the world that we're in, but we are creating it from a level that is not the level of the conscious mind. Now, early on your path, yes, maybe you do a visualization and a manifestation, and, and it shows up, and you feel very empowered. But if you keep on going, saying, look, I can manifest for people whatever they want, you're, you're really moving into grandiosity um, and God's territory. You may get it, but it's not, the, it's not the big enchilada. It's not the final payoff. And here's why. Because bottom line behind it all, no matter what you get here, if you are identified with your ego mind and your physical body, then whatever you get is going to perish. Um, every book will at some point go out of print. Great monuments fade. I mean, the pyramids are still there, but hey, there must have been stuff before the pyramids, and we don't see much of those. Um, we find a fossil here and there. It is the nature of this world of time that everything changes, everything dissolves, everything ultimately takes on a different form. And the way we know that most, of course, is from death. You mm. can have everything you think you want, and if you are identified with a physical body and the ego mind, you're still going to die. And at the end of the day, you will have nothing because that was your identification. I do believe that after you die, the eternal part of you will be there going, okay, I, I got hooked. You know, I got addicted to, 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 to physical stuff, um, and, and I got off the journey somewhere. Now let me go back and try to do it differently. And maybe at that higher oversoul level, you actually choose an incarnation where now there isn't terribly much in the way of abundance or wealth because you know that you got sidetracked with that the last time. So maybe at the oversoul level, you choose this as a path that is more likely to bring you into enlightenment, into the realization of your oneness. But that's way above our pay grade here as, you know, beings running around just trying to, um, you know, make life work. So is it, is it okay to focus on abundance? I think it depends where you are. I think it depends why you're focusing on the abundance. But in the long run, the only abundance is what comes from spirit, is what comes from God. And mm -hmm. in the story of Exodus, um, this is the whole parable of the idea of manna from heaven. Um, for those who remember, uh, or if you've never read Exodus, when the Hebrew people are wandering through the wilderness, there is nothing they can eat. Um, you know, there's literally nothing there. What they get from God is manna. It appears in the morning. Um, they go out and gather it. It only lasts the space of one day. It isn't the, if they if they try to save it for the next day, it's rotten. They can't eat it. And this is a very power, oh, and it's exactly as much as they need for that day. They never get too much. They never get too little. Well, what more perfect metaphor could we have for how spirit takes care of us? God and spirit only live in the present tense. They, you know, there is no other time at the level of spirit. Therefore, spirit can only provide for us in the moment. Um, so mana, the idea that whatever you need, you will get in the moment, is there, um, is it's a perfect metaphor, and yet, boy, we really resist it. I do myself. You know, I'm looking at a month right now where I'm faced with an incredible number of bills, um, colleges, estimated taxes, work on the house, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I know there's no way I can pay all those bills. What, of course, I, I sort of kid myself with is, well, you know, I do have some money put away, um, and I can use that and pay the bills, but some part of me says, well, but then you won't have that money put away, um, mm -hmm. and you need that money put away. We want to store up money. We want to know that we are backed up, that we have, you know, the, uh, the retirement fund. Why? 
because we fear that at the end of the, our lives we're going to be crippled, we're not going to be able to do things, we're going to start. Now, as far as life on earth goes, all of those fears look very real. I mean, look around. You see lots of people who, you know, don't have enough. But is that really you? Um, should you make those kinds of comparisons? Now, that doesn't mean throw caution to the wind and, you know, go out and get yourself three Porsches. Um, but it might mean trust that all real needs will be met. And if something arises that you're not able to meet um, with abundance, then maybe there is a deeper level lesson in that. After all, how can we learn how mana works unless we are, in fact, living more in the present moment? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we really can't. So I think that's the abundance piece. I want to talk about the beauty piece, too. But let me pause and, you know, before we get too many things rolling here, too many balls in the air, um, what are your thoughts on, on that question? Because, I, 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 again, I, I think it's just such a, it's such a great question. Yeah, it really is. And I just wanted to underscore a couple of things that you said. Um, Please. The number one, you know, ultimately we'll be disappointed. And, and the Course explains clearly how the ego – chases after things that it believes will bring satisfaction or even if you overlay the word peace on that. And then, as we have all experienced, sometimes when we get what we want, and then once the shininess of it wears off, we're disappointed and the ego goes to look for something else to chase after. And it becomes this obsessive uh, running around the planet trying to gather from outside of us things that will bring us peace instead of going inward. So there's that point. Also, you know, we here on the show, what we refer to as plagues are the challenges of life, situations that force us to look within at ourselves and learn about ourselves because the ultimate goal is to know thyself. So as you look back on your life, the plagues that have come into your life have served as a catalyst to major growth. As you had said, if that hadn't happened with that screenplay, you wouldn't have gotten to the place where you can pivot and go in the direction that was meant for you. You yes. would have kept, kept pushing against that wall. As exciting and inspired as you may have felt, at soul level, it's, no, We here's where we need to go. This needs to be accomplished. But we needed to do some polishing, and this experience gave you those facets that would make this true goal. Right. More, I want to choose the right word, well, it, it, I, I think it acceptance, you know. Yeah, I, I think of it like those, um, you know, bumps along the side of the road that um, when you're not paying attention, and you start to veer off the road, your car goes J -j 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 -j, and you think, wow, I have a flat tire. And then you realize, oh, no, and you steer back onto the road. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the plagues, the hardships, the places where we seem to meet really dense resistance in life um, are often really just ways of getting us back on track. And back mm -hmm. on track might even be, wow, I thought I was my own agent. I thought I could do this on my own. I really can't. You know, it might be what in my book I, 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 I call, you know, a tenth plague experience. The, uh, you know, uh, in 12-step parlance, hitting bottom. I can't do it. it it's not going to happen of my own. I am now faced with an obstacle that I have no idea how I'm going to manage it. You know, there, uh -huh. I'm, I'm backed against the Red Sea, and there is no way through. But that is a very powerful moment if we use it to say, yeah, I surrender. I surrender my ego self. And surrender is an interesting word because the ego is always in a war, and the ego never wants to surrender. But I surrender my ego self and I turn the whole thing over to, in 12-step language, a higher power. Um, but, you know, we know what that higher power is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's Holy Spirit in the Course's terminology or spirit mm -hmm. or God. Um, but so that, you know, yeah, you've been deprived of what you thought you wanted. And, you know, when you got something better. I mean, I'd be very curious if someone could do a survey, how many people were in an intense love relationship that failed – on the heels of which they married someone who, looking back, was so much better a fit for them than, than the person they were so desperately in love with. And yet at the time, the collapse of that love relationship was the most devastating thing that ever happened to them. I'll bet you we could, you know, fill cities with those people. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And so far as, you know, you had said the, the, what our focus is, if we're so focused on abundance um, and having gone through this lesson several times in several cycles of my life at varying degrees, you know, we, we're always going to focus on money because we do need money to survive. We do need shelter. We do need clothing. We do need food. However, if someone listening is um, having trouble really making that happen, we have to go back to making something happen and letting it happen because, as I said, poverty is a symptom, not a cause. It's a symptom of a belief in your mind that blocks abundance from coming to you. So, again, when we open our arms in acceptance and and weed out those misbeliefs, those misperceptions about money or, or ourselves, that is when we start to see change in the outside. So I just wanted to reiterate that focus versus acceptance type of thing where the ego can become so obsessed, you know? Yes, yes. And, you know, again, abundance uh, or poverty really in the mind of the beholder. I mean, studies on happiness show that the your, your, your um, tribes out in the middle of the jungle who have very little contact with civilization and in terms of amenities have almost nothing um, tend to be extremely happy. You know, they work mm-hmm. together. They, I, I think, in a way, the fact that poverty seems to be such a blight in our country, is it, the United States, is in part a measure of the fact that we have this value system that says our gods and heroes, our CEOs who are making amounts of money that are absolutely absurd. I mean, you know, there's nothing. What do you do with that much money? I mean, if you've got that kind of money and you haven't sort of checked in with guidance to say, all right, I've been gifted with this. How do I want to bring this into the world? How do I want to help the world? Then, you know, to me, that's that's just gluttony, you know? Yes. Um, so we don't know what, what happiness even really looks like in that regard. Um, yes. My daughter is currently studying in Copenhagen, Denmark, a socialist country, where the divisions between, you know, probably the poorest people and the richest people are maybe a matter of, you know, two or three times as opposed to two or three thousand or ten, twenty thousand time difference. And people are very happy. Um, and there aren't the same levels of worry. Um, and there aren't the same levels of poverty, but there aren't the levels of, of wealth either. So, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting that if you look around where there's great wealth, there is also great poverty. Russian oligarchs, um, you know, um, mm-hmm. blood diamond dictators in Africa, the, the, the poorest countries um, or the most impoverished populations often give rise to these, these quote-unquote elites with great wealth. Well, you know, that's the way the culture values it, whereas there are other countries where that, that absolutely isn't the total goal. Mm-hmm. But but it is a good point. I mean, we don't want people thinking, you know, the, the the typical religious fallacy, all money is bad, filthy lucre, the root of all evil. I mm-hmm. need to give away everything I have and, you know, live in sackcloth. And, uh, you know, I, I think that also just gives more power to the idea of money. Now you're just doing it from the negative polarity. Right. Now, instead of I love it and I worship it and I'm attracted to it, now it's like I hate it, I've got to push it away. But psychology will tell you that's what we call a, a defense called reaction formation. You're, you're, you're going to the opposite pole because at some level you're still hooked on the idea of money. So, right. you know, strong attraction, strong repulsion, love, hate, those are very, very closely related. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a good um, caution to tell people, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're striving for, that's fine. But look at your motives. Look around you and and see. Uh, so we need a car. What function does that serve? Why well, need reliable yes. transportation? But does it have to be the three Porsches you mentioned? And do they yeah. have to be a specific color? Um, is it obsessive? Are my motives born of fear, struggle, jealousy, or are they born of peace, where peace can be embraced without having to struggle so much? So you allow yourself to surrender your struggle. You're not surrendering anything, but the ego's struggle. And then you allow things to come into your life that will bring you that contentment and peace that you desire. Exactly. And when we're not attached to a form, all kinds of things can come up. So let's just run with that example. So Mm -hmm. your car broke down and 
your work is, I don't know, 15, 20 miles away, and you've got to get there to support your family, and you're thinking, I absolutely have to have a new car. How am I going to get one? And you're scanning, uh, you know, cars.com, looking for something um, that you can afford. But meanwhile, your fear is kicking in because everything you're looking at looks like it's just a piece of junk that's going to break down on the way to work, and that doesn't give you a very good feeling. And to the idea of a car, I think you'll probably find one, um, and you'll buy it, and you won't trust it, and it will continue to break down. But you don't know. Maybe one of your coworkers says, you know, hey, um, we've never talked much, but, you know, I only live about a mile away from you. If you'd be willing to split the gas with me, I'm happy to give you a ride. And maybe now you guys ride to work together and discover that you really kind of like each other and that there's mm-hmm. a lot to learn from each other. And now you've gotten this friendship that you never would have had if you were driving in the car. In other words, we do not know the path that ultimately brings us to happiness. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I absolutely love about the Abraham Hicks teachings, which look like um, channeled works on manifestation, here's how you manifest it, is Abraham says over and over, it's not about the manifestation. It's about happiness. Uh, It's about having, starting with the idea that you are happy and that you can be happy no matter what the external portrays, and that when you are happy, it's just much, much easier to manifest whatever it is that's needed. Well, happiness is, you know, we, I, I could say happiness is next to godliness. Um, when we're happy, we actually are much more in tune with what our true state is, and therefore it makes sense that whatever is needed in a world of form, whatever you know, the particular manifestation is, will come through. But we don't know what that is. And And when we can really step back and let go of our ideas of how the world should work and, you know, say to God, all right, I surrender, I'm I'm ready to hear your ideas of how the world should work and implement those, that's where we get miracles. That's that's the beauty um, of A Course in Miracles, you know, and and now we understand that that life actually can work in a completely different way than we ever believed as we receive different kinds of miracles, synchronistic occurrences, our trust builds that that in this other way. And we stop relying on our ego and manipulation and planning and all of these other defensive strategies. And we start to trust more that things can just show up. And as we trust, they do show up. And the more they show up, the more we trust. And eventually, we come to a worldview that says, all right, I don't have to do this myself. You know, of myself, I need do nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that means if you don't have to do it yourself, well, who's doing it? And and how is that force, to use George Lucas terminology, how is the force related to you? And ultimately, you get down to that realization that it, it is just you, it's all you. But when you are feeling happiness, when you are feeling oneness, when you are feeling joy, when you are able to approach the world with forgiveness uh, rather than grievances uh, and attack thoughts, then that's what you're projecting out, and then that's what you're going to get back. But mm-hmm. the reason to do it is not to have a nice projection. The ultimate reason to do it is because you want to escape from the project. You want to remember who you really are, Mm -hmm. Um, And as each one of us does that, we increase the chances for everybody else to do it. As you and I are doing this show, even if absolutely no one else is listening, I fully believe that, that we are changing the universe because of what this does for you and I. Yeah, Um, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. And I have to tell you, you know, this, you're, the things you're saying and the things I've experienced recently is just putting such a, a smile on my face because I was reminded, not in any um, spiritually glamorous way, but I was reminded that I have a tendency to kind of lean back a bit and think that something's all up to me. And ah. to uh, to reinforce the statement you just made about um, who are we doing this with, we are co-creators of our lives. It's not all up to us. And we're not we're not subject to whatever God wants for it. We co-create. So that was an important distinction, and when you said mm. that, I wrote it down. We have to co-create our lives together with the higher realm. Otherwise, we can't know. We we can't know what's best for us. We have to do this in tandem. Exactly. Yeah. Well, 
ultimately it's realizing that the ego self has no connection to spirit, but that when we use when we use ego simply as I say in From Plagues to Miracles, is kind of the interface, the operating system for a physical body being in a world of physical form, and we're not attached to it, to use the Course's uh, idea. When we use the body only as a communication device, then we are serving the purpose of the atonement. And the, whole, you know, the, the Course talks about how the Holy Spirit essentially can take anything in the ego's world and use it for the purpose of atonement, salvation, forgiveness, because that's the Holy Spirit's function, and because that's reality. You can't fight reality. You can't fight City Hall. Um, mm -hmm. So from the Holy Spirit's perspective, um, anything that we do see, think, can 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 undergo this reversal, and um, ah, I forgot where I was going with that one, but but that you know that's what it's that that that's what we're about is to to not see it as an individual self pushing through, but an individual self that realizes its severe limitations, but also realizes that it's the ruler of the universe. You know, less than, I don't know, what is it, 153, myself is ruler of the universe. Sounds really arrogant, but no, you created the universe of form and illusion, so therefore you can allow it to be uncreated, undone for you. The Course wouldn't mm -hmm. use the word creation, it would use the word made. And at the same right. time, because you are the Son of God, you are the universe. You know, the and do you remember that experience I had where... I, I think it was a dream that I had, and then I saw a picture a picture of the galaxy inside my brain. Yeah, you remember that? I, it was within, within the past year I had that experience. So I'm so different since mm -hmm. then that you know, with my and my hand is always holding on to his capital H, and yes. that I mean this happened to me last Friday, um, Thursday. There's a major problem. I go to bed. You know, we both did. We go to bed upset. We wake up in the morning kind of despondent. And I'm driving in the car, and I was like, no, I, I can't do this. I'm not doing this. This is not me to be panicked or depressed or whatever. So I turned on my Christian music, and I'm singing along about God and Jesus, and I get home. <laughs> and I get this pull, and I look over at my mailbox. It says, something's in that mailbox. You better go check it out. So I did, and it was the solution to my problem. Oh, how lovely. But at least I got back to peace before I got home, and you know what I mean? Well, I, I would I, argue that, if you hadn't gotten back to peace, it, you probably wouldn't have had that thing in your mailbox. Exactly, and, that's, and that was my point, like the, that I, I chose and I made that decision to be happy despite the external. It's going to work out. They're working for you. They're helping, and it's not all up to you. And right. there, there was a kernel of forgiveness that was necessary for the individual who incurred this large bill. Uh. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> It was something that was necessary to the household. It was purchased, and I got over it, and I know that all will be well, and I get home, and then it, it, there is no problem. So it's pretty um, – it's fascinating, and it, it's, everything that happens for me does nothing but fortify my trust and my faith and, and my certainty that and all is about. well as long as all is well within me, you know? And all things shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Absolutely. Um, one other idea, <clears throat> also from the course, that I think a lot of um, a lot of people have trouble understanding, including myself, for many many um, years as I studied the course, is the notion. Um, early on, the course talks about you know to have, give all to all, um, and 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 people and people read that <clears throat> and. People read that and they think, oh, I really do have to give away everything I've got. But at the highest level, at the only level, you don't have anything that you already are not. Everything that you have is what you are. Being and having are the same verb at the level of, of God, at the level of your true self. So in that sense, if your being is one of love and happiness, then sort of refracted into physical reality, what you have will be love and happiness and whatever, you know, um, accoutrements, whatever, you know, whatever objects and relationships and things reflect that in physical reality. But ultimately, we can't have what we aren't. You know, that would be to defy reality and that would truly be to separate from God and 
start a whole other universe. And much as the ego would love to do that, it ain't going to happen. It's not mm-hmm. possible. Right. So the ego goes around searching for all these substitutes. Remember, the ego's motto is seek but do not find. The ego loves mm-hmm. seeking. Um, as you said, it'll find a bauble, and that's great, I've got it. And then after two days, it's like, oh, is that all that is? Let me go finding yeah. another one. What's um, next? So the e- yeah, the ego's going to keep seeking because the ego doesn't want you to ever pause and stop and realize, ooh, this feels good. I have an inner sense of peace. I feel love within me. That That's all-encompassing. I don't need anything else but that. Um, love which created me is what I am. And because the moment you're there, then the whole idea of abundance and having and, you know, and sort of seeing that manifested in physical reality, it, it just, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, if we were here and I were going, ooh, you know, I really need the latest Barbie doll. And did you see she's got this neat little comb for brushing her hair? I mean, it might be very important if you're five years old, but at a certain level of what I like to call spiritual maturity, these things, they, they just, they don't impact us. And mm-hmm. I, I like to project it forward, and I think this is why, you know, the real enlightened folks, the gurus out there, can sort of look at people and say, what are you upset about? Everything's absolutely perfect. And we turn around and go, how can you say it's perfect? You know, ISIS is cutting off heads and the economy doesn't look good and China's in a tailspin and blah, blah. And they just say, no, everything's perfect. Why? Because that's all just the dance of samsara. That's Maya doing its thing. There's Mm -hmm. no ultimate reality to it. Your Mm -hmm. inner being is absolutely perfect. It's untouched and untouchable by the seeming storms and trials and tribulations of physical reality. Um, And so when we can, you know, stop running the ego's race and get to that place of, gee, I have chased after and gotten 20 things I wanted, and there are another 20 that I chased after and didn't get, but, you know, gosh, my life didn't end. There must be another way, as Bill said to Helen. Then we can stop. We can be still. We can experience the peace that passeth understanding, uh, the peace that can never come from the ego, and begin to know that that is our reality, that that's who we are. And that's all A Course in Miracles is trying to do, is teach us that and get us there. I mean, that's all, because that's all there is to do. (laughs) That's perfect, because that ties into another question I received. Um, A student wrote in asking, well, how do I know I'm perceiving incorrectly? So I took them to chapter 8 where it talks about wrong perception and it states wrong perception is the wish that things be as they are not so it says it right there in one complete statement that if you are wishing that things are other than as they are you are in the ego and perceiving wrongly miscreating as you go because every thought you have is powerful and you will miscreate and you will quote like you said of course uses the word made not create when it's talking about the ego you're going to make a mess and then we're in this mess and say, how do we get? How did we get here? But that ties in perfectly with that question. How would you add to that? Um, I, I got distracted for a second, but but let me just go to that idea. I think it actually is lovely because you know there's a hermetic saying, "As above, so below." Mm-hmm. That's staying. Can, can you repeat it? It was sort of like um, if I mis misperception is wanting it, what isn't. The... It's it's chapter eight. The 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 student wrote in how do how do I know when I'm misperceiving? So I directed them to chapter eight with the um, passage about wrong perception, where it says wrong perception is the wish that things be as they are not. Okay, which means... great. Yes. Yeah, so at at the highest level. All perception is wrong perception because it's the wish that things be as they are not. It's the wish that we are separate from God, that we are autonomous, that we are self-creating. Um, a wish that can never be because you can't, you know, you can't contradict or go against God. Not because he, she, it is just all powerful or is going to punish you. It's just oneness is one. There is nothing that can stand outside of oneness and go, oh, well, you might be one, but I'm not. That Mm -hmm. violates the laws of oneness. So, Mm -hmm. yes, you can't have what isn't, but then that, that sort of, again, if you, if you take that down to the level of, 
of, of physical per perception, it still holds true. And this is where um, people like Byron Katie can say, if it's showing up in your life, you better accept it. Um, there's a course lesson that says, let all things be exactly as they are. You know, on the face of it, that sounds pretty stupid. I mean, it almost it's a tautology. What do you mean? Well, of course they are as they are. Well, what it's saying the same thing you're talking about. At the level of perception even, okay, if it's here in my life, it has a healing purpose, it's teaching me something. Um, if I rail against it or, you know, try to change it, then, yeah, I'm not perceiving accurately. Uh, so I think that's actually quite quite lovely. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And and you just brought it back full circle because um, there's a, a large question, and you just used the word oneness, and oneness is unity. And the core problem is we are all, us, the sonship, and God the Father, we are all already united. We simply have a perception of separateness. Yes. This is what we're fighting against. So that brings me to the next question of unification of purpose. On In Chapter 8, it mentions the unification of purpose, then, is the Holy Spirit's only way of healing. This is because it is the only level at which healing means anything. The reestablishing of meaning in a chaotic thought system is the way to heal it. It's perfect. It's perfect, yeah. I mean, there is no other meaning. There is no other purpose. If you're following any other purpose, then you're off track. You know, again, it's not wrong. It's just not terribly helpful. Um, right from the, the get-go, the Course says, you know, free will does not mean you can choose the curriculum. It only means you can choose, you know, when you, the, the, the time when you want to take a particular lesson. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can kick and scream and put it off and be miserable for a very long time, but ultimately we have to, you know, we, ha we have to learn the lesson. Yes, and that brings me to, I wanted to bring up, I, someone got in touch with me and, and mentioned how they had studied the Course, and I started to explain. So I thought it would be good to bring it up in this segment. Um, uh -huh. What they asked was, I guess they weren't getting a whole lot of benefit from the course. And then I, I did some digging and asked some questions. And it boiled down to, is there a wrong way to study the course? And the course itself says no. But like you said, you cannot determine the curriculum. But right. I believe there are ineffective ways to study it so that you are not getting maximum benefit, especially if you do not sense changes in your mind. What this individual was doing is they studied the lessons only, but did not read the text. So I went on to explain, is, and I had to change my words for their understanding. These, these two components are interdependent in that when you do the lessons, it unlocks, or at least it did for me, it unlocks the chains that hold you captive to the ego so that you can start to break down those thought processes and then rebuild them in the right mind. The text, if you study it, although it is abstract, as you do, having done the lessons helps you absorb the material of the text. That, in turn, the text then helps you understand what the lessons are about because then certain phrases are familiar, certain concepts are familiar. So so insofar as timing, that go go according to your own pace, but they are interdependent. How would you clarify or well, dispute what I said? The introduction to the workbook does say that, you know, the text provides a, a theoretical foundation for the workbook lessons right. um, that is essential. On the other hand, if you flipped it around and someone just read the text and loved the abstractions but never practiced the workbook, um, you know, that's probably even less helpful because the workbook lessons are where the rubber meets the road. Right. I mean, when you're reading a lesson that tells you you should be thinking of this thought, uh, you know, on the hour and meditating, I mean, you know, using the practice period for the first five minutes of every hour or calling it to mind at least five or six times in the course of an hour, and, of course, your ego makes sure that doesn't happen because life gets yeah. in the way, you mm -hmm. know, that's where we really get to apply it. Um, a couple... I, I think that it is important to do the text. One thing that, remember, this is a holographic system. What do I mean by that? I mean, you could probably take any paragraph, certainly any section, and within that section is a teaching that might use different words and concepts, but essentially is, is just a, um, a reflection of the whole. Mm -hmm. and, and even that is consistent with the Course's philosophy. If there's only oneness, 
the course is, is kind of like this, this little channel for oneness to come in, and wherever you pick it up, you're going to get the same lesson. It takes three lines. You know, the whole thing can be summed up. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. God. And then Mm -hmm. takes another 1,249 pages to elaborate that, give us all the exercises. We need that much data and distraction that seems similar, but that is the same in order for us ultimately to realize that this world around us that seems so, you know, complicated and and, and, and full of different moving pieces is all se- essentially one. When you read the text and do the workbook lesson simultaneously, which is what I would suggest, you don't have to read the whole text to do the workbook. Um, nope. You know, um, you don't have to finish the workbook to go back to the text, that's for sure. You don't have to wait till you finish the workbook to look at the manual for teachers. They're the manual for teachers has some of the best stuff in the entire course. It's so beautifully mm-hmm. written and so succinct. Use your own guidance. Um, see, you know, even just ask, okay, Holy Spirit, what should I do here? But when you are using them simultaneously, what often happens is you will start to get synchronicities within the course itself so that your workbook lesson actually is um, reinforced in a way, by what you're reading in the text, or you read something in the text, and the next day's workbook lesson takes that and, and brings it into, you know, 3D living color a little more for you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I agree with you. I think that what's going on at a mental process level is different, too, in that we're reading the text, and we're trying to absorb its message, and it can be pretty dense going. Uh, and, you know, some of the phrasing is preposterous, the um, you know some of the punctuation uh, defies English language uses. Um, mm-hmm. All of that's there, but but we wrestle with it, and in wrestling with the text, we actually are learning. We're figuring. I mean, I remember you know in the early going, I'd constantly misread a word and be like, wait, could it really be saying that? And then I'd go back and see it again. Um, Bill Thetford talked about how you know as they were going through it, they they'd miss they they. Talk, uh, salvation would be written as slavation. Um, you know, uh, they'd misspell That's crucifixion funny. as cruci f i c t i o n, um, which is just lovely because the course says it's all a dream anyway. It's a fiction, but but in oh, reading the text, oh my god, isn't that cool? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you know, when you're reading the text, you're wrestling with it at one level. Then you take it to the workbook, and now you're wrestling with it. It's almost like the text we're we're dealing in our own heads, the workbook, we take it out in the world, and yet they're both ultimately the same thing. So I I agree with you. I think it is a good idea to do both. Um, It is how I did it. I started reading the text. I started doing the workbook lessons fairly early on. I probably had read, I don't know, three or four chapters in the text before I started doing the workbook lessons. Um, and I finished the workbook, you know, I don't know, in a year and nine months the first time. It took me about two and a half years before I got through the whole text. But use your guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it's okay to say, okay, this section of the text that I'm in, I, I don't get this at all. This is just gibberish. Go somewhere else. Um, you know, skip it and yep. go to the next section. Skip the whole chapter and go to the next mm-hmm. one. You know, there's a very famous uh, story about someone asking Bill Thetford, you know, I don't understand this and it doesn't make sense. Uh, And he said, okay. And he ripped the page out of the book and said, there, now try it. You know. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because it's all the same message. And what the ego is going to do. Yeah, the ego's going to take one thing and go, oh, I hate this. This doesn't make sense. I'm going to throw the whole book away. (laughs) Right. Which I've seen people do. However... Which is a sh- it's it's a shame, but that's okay. But as you said, you know the text is the theory; it's the theoretical. The the lessons is the practice, and that is what facilitates the shift in conscious awareness, and that's what you're going for. So, if you're riding a bicycle, you need two wheels, you need two handlebars to have Good. some semblance of balance. But with those energetic shifts, let your higher self determine what's best for you in how your conscious, your mind perceives, and how. Your ego uses your personality against you, and let spirit get around your ego to get to the core, to drop those concepts in that create those shifts. Make yes. sense? Yes. Good 
stuff. Um, and also, ladies and gentlemen, don't listen to when people uh, who I'm sure their intentions are good, but they take the time to record the lessons. And some people, it's come to my attention, instead of actually doing the lessons from the book, they're listening to someone else say it, and while they're checking their email, that huh. is distracted. That That's is not, not doing the lesson. That is not committed. And, Dr. Bob, you wanted to talk about atonement as a total commitment. Did you want to touch on that quickly? Um, well, it goes back to that idea of, you know, that there's only one purpose. Um, and if we're aligned with that purpose, then what manifests in our life, you know, supports that uh, you know, uh, the first section of Chapter 30 in the text, Rules for Decision, which could have been a work a part of the workbook, is very clear on, okay, here's how you start your day. You align with purpose. Um, right. You basically say, uh, as the Course says in several places, the only function of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. So it's kind of like if you started each day, okay, today I accept atonement for myself. I am here only to be per- to, I'm here only to be um, helpful, helpful. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. et cetera, then, you know, you're in alignment and you're open uh, to things coming up. But the Course tells us, the text says fairly early on that the atonement is a total commitment. And, and uh, again, a lot of people read that, myself included, uh, init- originally, and go, well, what do you mean? You know, I got all kinds of other things going on in my life. I can't make a total commitment to this. At the level of intention, however, you can. At the level of intention, you can say, this is what I want more than anything because it's the only thing that exists. And, of course, at first, you're not going to believe that. The introduction to the workbook says you're not going to like some of these lessons. You may not believe them. You might actively resist them. None of that matters. Just Mm -hmm. do them. And as you do them, they will show you that they are true. I I think that is probably the best advice I could give anyone for doing the course because – we are stuck in a virtual reality insane asylum that we have grown up uh, believing is real, and everyone we know has grown up believing it's real. So how do you reverse that that learning? How do you, you know you need something that that acts almost like a Trojan horse that brings reality in, and of course you're going to resist it. It flies in the face of all of your quote unquote good judgment and everything you've ever known. Right. So. So you're going to resist it, but as you apply it, it's what we were talking about earlier, you know, and then miracles start to happen. Relationships as you practice forgiveness, you know, really difficult relationships, suddenly just like the difficulty goes out of them. And you think, wow, you know, that person really changed since I did the course. Uh, No, you changed. Right. But since we're not different people, really, it's only one mind. Your change is their change. But use it, and then you see the changes, and and that ultimately becomes, you know, the only way to prove to anyone. I mean, if someone said to me, well, you know, prove to me this works, I don't believe you, I'd have to say, I, I can't do that for you. I can only tell you what my own experience is, and you can certainly discount that. Um, but give it a try, and then you'll have your own experience. Yeah, I just tell them to look into my eyes. And, and oh, look, that's sweet. Take a, take a good look at my face. Yeah. What you don't see is the trauma from the past, the, the large majority of it, and there was a lot of it. But what you don't, because I look so much younger than I actually am, at least 10 years younger than I actually am, and I say that's forgiveness, yes. you know. And um, I love what you said about, you know, I can't commit to that with all this chaos going on. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> study the book, do the lessons, and there won't be any more chaos. It will all make perfect sense. It smooths out. You get the guidance. They, once you there's that little bit of willingness the course asks for. Yeah. But you offer that little bit of willingness, and suddenly your days go smoother. And you're just, I'm not going to put words in people's heads for what will happen for you, but you will notice a significant change in your perceptions and your conscious awareness. Doctor Bob, we have a, a caller on the line with a question. Okay, I, and I have to. I only. I can only take this one question because I have um, another uh, call that okay. I have to get to in 15 minutes. So. Okay, I just wanted to. <laughs> but let's be sure. let's definitely take the caller. All right, I believe I know who this is. Welcome to the show. What's your name? Okay. Hi, this is John. How are you? Hi, John. Hey, John. It is you. This is my friend, John, Doctor Bob. Hi, Hi Charlotte. Hi, Doctor Bob. How are you? Nice to nice to talk to you. Same. Same. I, I just want to mention how how happy I am to hear you both back on the radio, and it's um, it's been 
you know, such perfect timing to, to get my Holy Spirit activated again, hearing you speak. And um, I just am... <clears throat> I'm just realizing that the, the less I try to have my Holy Spirit work for me, the more it does. Yeah, isn't that funny? We the, the task is to get out of the way, not to you know force it to happen. Exactly. The second I try to create with my mind, obviously my ego gets in the way, and my Holy Spirit is not able to be doing what it's meant to do. I mean, you know, the reason the Course can say I need do nothing is that the whole concept of doing is predicated on the idea that you're a body. Only bodies can do. Minds minds are about ideas. They're not about doing. So the moment we conceptualize anything as, okay, I have to do this now, in a sense we've already bought into the ego body delusion and now we're going to, you know, have to sort of strong arm it and, you know, make it happen top down and plan it. And the moment we do that, we've lost the Holy Spirit. There's no chance for a miracle. Um, you know, we're probably going to get a plague of some kind, or if we get it half <laughs> right, the other half's going to go wrong. Uh, so you're right. It's it's about, you know, um, what's the, the, the lesson? I will step back and let him lead the way. Uh, lesson 155. I, I love that. You know, yeah, it doesn't say I'm not going to go anywhere. It says I will step back and let him lead the way. And I'm learning that more and more, and obviously with both of your help, um, that it makes it easier. And um, the more I think of the future, the past, or worries, or any of the other things that get in the way that are involved my ego, it also obviously creates an issue for my Holy Spirit to communicate properly. But as I work all those things out of the way on, on those days where I really am, am channeling properly, it's amazing how my Holy Spirit just reaches out mm. and uh, does what it's supposed to do and communicates with others, the joy of, of, of the spirit. So, um, that sounds great. Just, well, you know, you're, you're inspiring uh, for all of us because that is, that's the walk we all have to do. You know, yeah, it, so, it, it really is just moment by moment, uh, you know, practicing it. And I think it's also very, uh, as as human beings, we uh, tend to judge uh, a lot. And I think that's another thing that is obvious that we need to work on is that we, we can't be judging others um, because that also can uh, create an issue for us um, in our communication that we're meant to be doing. And uh, so I work on that as well. And I... I um, I uh, know that that's in, in the course, and and uh, I just wanted to thank you guys once again for everything, and uh, just mention those items. Thank Appreciate you, John. it, John. I'm very proud thank of you. Thank you, guys. You're doing amazing work. All right, I'm going to put you on hold, and we're going to go to our prayer. Great, thanks, Char. He's done a remarkable job since he picked up that book, and uh, uh, he's a he's a good friend. Okay, so we'll go to our prayer, and um, I look forward to spending more time with you next month. Second Tuesday of the month, we'll do another hour and topic to be announced. And um, here we go, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, and this is from, of course, the book you got me for my birthday a couple of years ago. Choose once again, ah. Collections from A Course in Miracles, published by the Foundation for Inner Peace. This is on page 102. It is as follows. Father, our name is yours. In it, we are united with all living things, and you, who are their one creator. What we made, and called by many different names, is but a shadow we have tried to cast across your own reality. And we are glad and thankful we were wrong. All our mistakes we give to you, that we may be absolved from all effects our errors seem to have. And we accept the truth you give, in place of every one of them. Your name is our salvation and escape from what we made. Your name unites us in the oneness, which is our inheritance and peace. Amen. Amen. Until next time, everyone, God bless and be at peace.